the very best way to experience happiness is to be who you are, who you really are, not anyone who you're trying to pretend to be, and then give yourself, give of yourself, help other people through who you are. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is such a good one. I would say it's a must listen. So today we are exploring the topic of how to find true happiness, releasing the old notions of what society taught us about happiness and cultivating the parts of our lives that bring us real happiness, even amidst the chaotic and challenging world we live in today. Our guest is Stephanie Harrison. Stephanie Harrison is an expert in the science of happiness and the creator of the new happy philosophy. She has a master's degree in positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, where she was later an instructor and was previously the director of learning at Thrive Global, leading the development of science-based programs that improve well-being. Stephanie's new book, New Happy, Getting Happiness Right in a World That's Got It Wrong, just released this past May. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm good. I'm so excited to be here with you. So I feel really happy and and positive. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Okay. I'm super excited to get into today. As I was saying before the call, like I love your brand and I think you're just doing such a great job. Everything is so clear, bold, and it's, it's just like communicates so well, like the visuals and everything. Why don't we start with uh, what inspired you to start The New Happy and what's the story behind it? I wanted to help people to figure out how to be happier because I had struggled with how to be happy in my own life. You know, when I was in my early 20s, I was a very unhappy person, very stressed, very overwhelmed. I struggled with my physical health and my mental health, and I felt really lonely and had all of these challenges. And so I personally found it really hard to be happy. And I I thought, well, maybe I'm not the only person who's struggling with this. Maybe there's more of us out there. And ultimately, that's what led me to want to study the science of happiness and well-being. And while I was doing that, I discovered that there are so many of us who are, in fact, feeling this way. And I really wanted to give people the resources and the tools that would help to benefit them without uh, forcing them to go through scientific journals and figure it all out for themselves. <laughs> Yeah. So when you started this, were you already, like you've already been studying the science of happiness for a while? Yeah. So what happened was this moment of really deep despair that I had was around 2013. And then that's what motivated me to go to grad school. And that happened in 2015 and 2016. And then once I graduated, I I was working full-time at another job. I didn't quite know how to start sharing these ideas with people. So I just started the new happy as a newsletter. And then eventually a couple of years later, I kept it up while I was working full time and then eventually decided to devote myself fully to it. And that's when I started making the artwork and coming up with these different ways of communicating these ideas. Oh, so you were the one designing everything. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I was going to ask about your background because I think, I mean, my my question is like, tell us about your background that you think contributed to the success of your brand, you know, with everything that you do. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I'm not a, I'm not a professional designer. I'm self-taught. It was all very intuitive in many ways. And what happened was um, in the early days of the pandemic, I started thinking like, how do we, how do we help everyone out there who's really having a hard time and really suffering? And I realized that I could start to translate some of this research into these visuals that communicated the ideas. And I landed on doing it through artwork because I think I've always seen things in my mind, like having this sort of visual thinking when people, when I read something or talk to people, I have a lot of mental pictures floating around in my head. And I thought, maybe I can start sharing them and putting them out there. And so I, um, I taught myself how to use a design program and started trying to wow. make stuff and seeing what happened. And then over time, I've been able to learn more and develop and, you know, um, like get mentors and support and all that, which has been really helpful. So a lot of this has been my own journey of kind of trying to be a, a more creative person as well, which has been really fulfilling. 
Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting to hear that you literally just like taught yourself everything because it looks so professionally yeah. done, <laughs> right? Thank you. Well, I've yeah. come a long way. A lot of mm-hmm. the old ones don't look that way. <laughs> so it's taken it's taken a lot of time to sort of land on the style and the visual language and all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. really for the first like year or so, it was just me sitting down at my computer and like trying to get a little bit better every day. You know what I mean? Like trying just to be a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more clear and testing ideas and stuff. And that process of trial and error was uh, ultimately kind of what helped get to this point in time. Amazing. And then in terms of your knowledge and philosophy on happiness, how much did that come from your studies and research and how much did it come from your own experience? Like kind of walk us through how you kind of came to this, this philosophy that you have now. Yeah. Well, it was really sparked by my own personal experiences of looking around in my life and being like, I followed all the rules. I did all the things that I was supposed to do and I'm not very happy. I'm actually quite unhappy. And that was the moment of spark that led me to want to go figure it out. And then when I got to grad school, I started reading all of this research and all of these scientists know this stuff already, right? Like Mm. they know that chasing external achievements isn't necessarily going to make you much happier. They know that connection and kindness and being of service and having a purpose, that's what matters most. And I was sort of frustrated because we had all of this information, but it wasn't disseminated in the public consciousness in any way. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started pulling those pieces together and trying to figure out ultimately like, where did we go wrong? What what happened? What were the stories and the messages that we received that have hurt us and in many ways um, affected so, so many of us? Um, and then I started to land on this idea that real happiness comes from helping other people. So using who you are in order to help other people to be happy. And then my life, I, I had a very difficult experience in my life where my partner suddenly became very ill. And out of nowhere, we were trying to, you know, save his life. And I was his full-time medical caregiver and our lives were just totally turned upside down. And I had this chance to uh, put these ideas into practice in my own life to see if they worked. And what amazed me was that even though my life was a mess in many ways, like everything that I had, uh, nothing that anyone would ever choose to experience in their lives I was still able to experience some level of happiness even during that time. And then when I contrasted it to the time in my early 20s when my life was like going well um, and I wasn't happy, it was just really fascinating to see how that played out. And that ultimately gave me a lot of confidence that, yes, this can really work for people and um, they, they should know about tools and strategies that help them. Yeah. And when you talk about the you know, that concept, it, it brings me back to like, let's start with the foundational like definition. Like, how do you define happiness? Cause it could be like temporary joy or it could be like yeah. fulfillment. <laughs> like it's, it's totally, <laughs> it can be so many things. And I don't think people are talking about the same things when they say happiness. So how do you define happiness? Yeah, it's such a good point. I think, um, you know, it's so important to recognize that these words like happiness, they ultimately end up getting colored by all of our contexts and our backgrounds and what we're told and all that kind of stuff. So happiness for me is the feeling and the state of being when you're connected to yourself, to others, or to the world around you. So those moments when you feel at peace with yourself, that's a sense of happiness. Those moments Mm -hmm. when you're having a really nice lunch with a friend, that's a moment of happiness. The times when you're out in nature or looking at the ocean, that's a moment of happiness. To me, it all comes back to that feeling of being connected. Mm. Okay. That's a great definition to get us started. So let's get into what is the old happy and what is the new happy? Like what were we taught and what are, where are we trying to go now? Okay. So old happy, we were taught that in order to be happy, you need to be perfect or get as close to it as possible. You need to optimize yourself and make yourself better. You need to achieve as much as you can. And usually what the people around you want you to achieve, not what you want to achieve, following a very particular path. 
And then you have to do it all by yourself. You can't ever lean on anybody. You can never struggle. You have to do it all alone. So those are the three core messages that we receive about happiness. And ultimately, what it turns into is a lot of people out there who are walking around thinking, I'm not good enough. I can show that I'm good enough if I achieve enough. And the best way to do that is to do it all by myself and to push through and achieve my own fulfillment and success. And that ends up making us miserable. Yep. And when you say this, I have you looked into whether this old happy definition is like a Western society thing? Like, is it cultural? Because I, I would imagine in different cultures, there it, there's slight variations, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's, there's some really good research that's been done on that exact topic. Um, so a lot of these old happy influences, you're so right to call them out. They're very Western in nature. They're grounded in cultures like individualism, which exactly. are all about elevating the individual above the self. And that ends up hurting us in the way that it instills these values in us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So what is the, the new happy? The new happy, the path that I believe is the very best way to experience happiness is to be who you are, who you really are, not anyone who you're trying to pretend to be, and then give yourself, give of yourself, help other people through who you are. So it's these two components of both be your individual self, but be that self situated in a broader context where you are contributing to others and they in turn are contributing to you. And those two elements are really important because not only does it help you to experience the personal joy and the fulfillment and the purpose, you know, and all the things that we want for ourselves, but it also ends up making other people happy at the same time. So elevating other people's well-being simultaneously. Yeah. So two comp- two components, one is being yourself and the other one is helping others. Because that exactly. is fulfilling yeah. as well. Okay. Can you break it down further or is it really just that simple? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we can keep breaking it down. Yeah, yeah um, let's keep breaking it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. It's like unpacking a box, yeah, right? Like I um, love unpacking. Let's get deeper. <laughs> like what does it mean to be yourself? <laughs> Another another really good question, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of what we've been taught about who we are is um, not only just that pressure that we feel to be perfect, but also the belief that, you know, you're bad, you're not a good person, you your weaknesses define you, you know, you always have to show and prove how worthy you are and all that kind of stuff. We have a lot of misplaced beliefs about our own selves. And I think that every person is good deep down. Everyone is good. Like no babies are evil, right? Every, every baby has that inherent goodness. Sometimes horrible things happen to people and they lose sight of that. But at all times, people do have access to that. Um, people are full of amazing gifts. They have wonderful qualities that ha- they can share, that they can use to help other people. And those gifts include your humanity, which is who you are as a person. So that's your goodness, your wisdom, which is what you have experienced in your life and what you have learned from it. Because all of us are living completely unique lives and those lives give us, give us wisdom that no one else will ever have access to. And then the third is your talent the things that you can do, the skills that you have, the strengths and capabilities. And so if you can discover those gifts, not only do you get to figure out more about who you are, but then then you get to figure out how you want to share those with other people at the same time. Okay. Can you repeat the three just so we get a recap? (laughs) Humanity, which is who you are, your wisdom, which is what you know, and your talent, which is what you can do. Humanity, wisdom, and talent. So you have to hone in on those three things to understand who you are and what you have to offer. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And like, you can sort of think about it. um, Sometimes it's really helpful to use that framework to look at somebody else. So like thinking about your best friend or a partner or somebody in your life who you love, like you can see how wonderful they are as a person, right? Like their kindness and their curiosity and the way that they give you their presence. That's their, that's their humanity. You can see their wisdom because they've gone through certain challenges in their lives and overcome them, or they've had unique life experiences that they can use to help other people. And then you can see their talents through what they do for work or how they show up in their community and all that. So, you know, you can also think about your gifts as like, what do people talk about at funerals? They talk about people's gifts. They talk about everything that the person offered through who they were and what they knew and how they behaved. So it can be a little tricky to find yours at first, but that's why having people around to show you and support you can be really helpful. 
Yeah. And I think it's nice because when you frame it in that way, then it's really about like the internal qualities versus like, oh, this person is this job or this person reached this status. Because going back to the idea of like old happy and new happy, old happy was like, you define yourself based on like your labels or external achievements. And then the new happy you're saying is you have to first understand like those invisible things that you have that is so valuable. And then use that in some way, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's that you've just nailed it. That's so beautifully said. Like it's almost like, you know, um, you know, in Superman when he like rips off his, his, his coat and stuff like that and turns into Superman. I always think Mm -hmm. of that image because it's like, that's kind of like what we're doing when we discover our gifts, you know, we're like sort of ripping off all of those external things that we're carrying and showing who we really are on the inside. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. No, it's really nice to like discuss this with you because I feel like this framework is what I, I apply to my life and I share in my, in my channel as well, but yeah. we just use different terms, right? Like I, I talk about it in the sense of, oh, this is how you feel like you live a purposeful life. And then you're talking about this is happiness, but really it's all the same thing. We just use different words to describe these facets, right? Totally. Yeah, exactly. And like, I think I'm, that's one of the reasons why I was so keen to talk to you about this stuff, because I know how much that matters to you. And I feel like, um, you know, like purpose is an inescapable part of happiness, right? Like you have to have something that you're living for. It can't just be about your own desires at the end of the day, that often turns really hollow, doesn't it? Yep. Um, So tell me about how you are living this philosophy now in your life, the new happy. Like, is it still hard for you? Do you still struggle with, you know, I I know a lot of us still have tendencies of the old happy that cling on to us for some reason. (laughs) There's still a part that cares about what other people think or cares about approval and whatever. So, so what is your journey like? Where are you are, where are you at right now? Yeah. You know, um, it's funny because I obviously was very affected by old happy and it was something that made a huge negative impact in my life. Um, so I still struggle with it. Um, I think of it as something like it's almost, I love the image that you have. It's almost like the tentacles reaching out to grab a <laughs> hold of you, right? Like <laughs> trying to bring you back. And I think that in some ways uh, we need to be, once we have that awareness of like, oh, that's old happy, that's something I'd like to leave behind, then we can start to, when we notice those tentacles coming to grab us, we can kind of step away and dart out of the way. So for me, one of the things that's been most helpful is just giving it the name of old happy. Like just being able to say, oh, that's not me. That's old happy trying to influence me and stuff like Mm. that. You know, like I have to live in the world like everyone else and it's an old happy world right now. And so it's easy to get sucked back into those ideas. But what helps the most is being like, oh, that's just old happy pressure. You don't want to go anywhere near that. You know, it doesn't help you. You know, it's not going to benefit you. And I found even just giving it the name has made such a big difference for my own well-being and my ability to separate myself from it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause when you name it, it's, it's not a part of you. It's just like a concept, right? Like, yeah. cause I think a lot of us have that internal battle. Like a part of us wants to prove ourselves and make our parents happy and this and that. And then a, the other part doesn't want that. And then if you just label it, oh, that's just old happy. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. It does make it easier because it's separate from you. Yeah. It's like, and you don't have to blame yourself for it. Right. Like I think, Part of um part of the way that old happy kind of clings on to you is if you try to do all of those things, you try to perfect yourself and achieve and everything, and then it doesn't work, you don't feel happier. Well, what do you do? You blame yourself. You're like, I'm mm-hmm. the problem. It's yeah. my fault. And then that just makes it all worse. And so to your point, like being able to say, oh, this isn't me. This is this kind of external system that's out there. You, you can stop blaming yourself and shift into a more compassionate way of treating yourself. Mm, yeah. So how does it feel living in the new happy? Like what are the, I guess, those mindset shifts and what, I guess, what does it feel like and what does it look like just so our listeners can get a better grasp of it? Yeah, I think for me, it's been, um, it's been completely transformative. I did not know that it was possible to feel the level of joy I get to feel, the level of contentment and peace and, but also like 
it doesn't eliminate the excitement of life. You know what I mean? Like the um, passion and energy and the desire to make a difference in the world. Like I feel like I have peace with the part of me that wants to go out and make a difference in the world and I'm not defined by it. Like I, I can enjoy the experience of doing it without feeling like my success defines my self-worth in that way. Um, so it's almost like it allows me to embrace both the side of contentment, but then the side of purpose as well. Yeah. Like that it's, it's so interesting to be able to live that way. Like it doesn't mean that you have no direction or no goals anymore. Like you still yeah. aim to do things, but you don't rely on the need to succeed. Right? Is that the difference? Like, I guess break down, what are the differences I think that's a beautiful way to describe it, to be honest. Um, I would say, like, I, I'm not telling, I'm not advocating that anyone give up on their dreams or their goals. We need you to have dreams and goals because that's what's going to make our world a better place, right? Like, I have dreams of helping people. I know you do too. And everyone listening here probably does as well. And that's a wonderful thing. What we want to do is to separate that pursuit of the dream from you deciding that you're a good person or a bad person, depending on how successful you are. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good point. Because I think a lot of people, like let's say you make a mistake or you fail, it, they, they make it about themselves. And then yeah, it just exactly. hurts your ego or just everything. You're saying yeah. it's possible to separate. <laughs> yes, It's it, possible it to <laughs> still pursue goals and dreams and basically focus on the pursuit rather than the outcome. Exactly. Yes, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. Like you find the joy as you pursue it. Yep. And then if you get to the outcome, fantastic. And if you don't, or if you decide to change your mind and do something else, or if you think, okay, like that was cool, but I'm not really interested in that anymore. That's totally fine because you've had all of this joy on the journey that really was right. fulfilling, right? Yep. Like it's not, you're not pinning all of your hopes on climbing to the top of the mountain. Exactly. People forget it's about the journey instead of the result. And this, this reminds me of a quote that I've shared online before, but there was, I, I, the story is like, someone asked a monk, like, what's the secret to happiness? And the monk was like, my secret to happiness is I don't mind what happens. Oh, <laughs> right? Goosebumps. Goosebumps. <laughs> it's so simple, but I think it took me years to truly understand it. Totally. Like if you can oh live gosh. in a way that you don't mind what happens, then everything is like a surprising, joyful experience. And even if things go wrong, like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, totally. But it doesn't make, you don't feel good or bad about it, right? Oh, it's interesting. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? And it's so wise to live in that way because I'm sure, I mean, I've had many times in my life that I've made a mistake or something hasn't gone the way I wanted to. And then ultimately it's led to good things in the future. Right. Like I didn't know that would happen though in that moment. Yeah. Like you can't define something as like good or bad. It just, it just is. And then it could lead to like something amazing. You just never know. I think you're so right to apply it to that because we need to take that lesson and apply it to ourselves. Like mm. the key is like, if you're successful today, if you're not successful, if you are struggling to be productive, if you get a lot done, whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect who you are as a person and your value and your worth in the world. Mm, yep. Yep. I can resonate with this so hard because I've been on this self-worth journey <laughs> of understanding you. that you are worthy without doing anything. Can you shed some light and some advice for our listeners that are struggling with that? It's really hard. I, so if you're in this position listening, I just want you to know that one, it's okay if you're struggling with it. And two, you can change. You can, you can learn how worthy you are. I think one of the things that's really helpful, and this is a, um, a tool that I have seen really help a lot of people, is to think about your the person that you're trying to be, the person that you think will make you perfect. Like uh, we have this list in our heads of all of the things that we need to do and the ways we need to look and the achievements and possessions we need to have. And then we think we'll be good enough, right? Um, so write down your list, like make a list of all of the things that you think you need to do in order to be worthy. And then just take a look and see how long that list is and how impossibly difficult it is for you to achieve it. And then rip it up, like physically rip up the list, <laughs> let go of that idea of having to be this perfect self 
because that will be what empowers you to be who you really are. So that's one tip. Another one, which is along the lines of what we've been talking about, is a tool that I call the breakup, which is breaking up who you are from what you do. So what happens most of the time is that uh, let's say that you make a mistake at work. You say to yourself, oh my God, I made a mistake. I'm such an idiot. Like, Stephanie, how could you do something like that? So what I want you to do instead is to break up those two statements. I made a mistake at work and then I'm an idiot. So now they're separate. They're not in one sentence anymore. And then I want you to replace the second sentence with I'm worthy still, no matter what. So I made a mistake at work and I'm still worthy. And it's that mindset that helps you to actually recover from those mistakes and overcome them and to be persistent and persevere towards your goals. Yeah. In that way, you can bounce back easier instead of going into that negative spiral, right? Where you just beat yourself up and <laughs> it just and gets that worse help, and worse. does it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It makes it so much worse. I know that there have been so many times when I've beaten myself up and all it does is it de- makes me depressed. It makes me want to curl mm-hmm. up in a ball on the floor and not do anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's much healthier to to do that breakup. I, I love those exercises. Thanks for sharing. I'm definitely going to try that after oh, today. Oh, thanks. Let me know what you think. I find it really helpful. I use it all the time because I make mistakes all the time and I I struggle and all that kind of stuff. And so every time I'm like, okay, I'm feeling really sad right now and I'm worthy or I got rejected right. and I'm still okay. You know, you can right. use it for as often as you want to. Love it. Let's also talk about, you know, the obstacles to happiness and how to overcome them. Like, what do you think are like the biggest obstacles to people finding this new happy? In some ways, some are internal, like overcoming these beliefs about, especially ones that have been deeply conditioned into us, you know, like some of these ones. If if you um, were raised in a way that made you uh, feel like you're not good enough and all that stuff, it can feel really hard to overcome those things. And it takes time and practice, obviously. But as I said, it is possible. The other things are kind of trying to sometimes put yourself out there in ways that are uncomfortable. You know, like putting, being happy involves being vulnerable in many ways. Like for you to pursue what matters to you or develop your skills and your talents and your gifts or share them with other people. Sometimes you have to put yourself out there and, you know, like risk rejection or risk feedback and all of that. And that can be really scary for people. Um, So that would be something I commonly think gets in the way. Yeah. Like our fears. And this reminds me of one of your visuals, the confidence one. (laughs) I love that one. (laughs) Can you remind our viewers what it is? Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, I'll give you a voiceover as well. If you're just listening, it's a gray circle. And then like at the end of the other end of the page, it's a red circle. And underneath it says, don't wait until you feel confident enough to act. And then below that, there's five circles in a row, but this time it's gray. And then it gets a little redder and redder and redder until it finally becomes that red one. And then the caption beneath says, your confidence builds as you take action. And I made that for myself in many ways. (laughs) It's a hard lesson to learn, but you can't think your way into confidence. Unfortunately, you have to act your way into it. You have to take action. And the action is usually scary if, if it's going to make you grow, but you have to do it. So it's like true happiness is also like challenging yourself, getting out of your comfort zone, being vulnerable, yeah. these things that are hard. And in the moment, it doesn't feel happy, <laughs> but after you do it, you're much happier and much more confident in yourself. I'm curious, like, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't easy for you to start, you know, doing this work and putting yourself out there, right? I'm sure it took a lot of courage for you. Yes, it took a lot of, well, courage to start is one thing, but also like the discipline to keep it going, right? Even if there's not no results and then there's dealing with just being an online persona where people give you criticizing comments and <laughs> if you're sensitive, it hurts you. But everything that was difficult and I overcame made me a stronger person. Right. And, and has led to more well-being and happiness, right? Like giving you the chance to experience, um, more joy and like, you've been able to help so many people, right? Like it's yep. all in many ways, like facing the fear is, um, so powerful because it allows you to do so much at the same time. Yep. And I also think another aspect of my job specifically, and also what you do is because 
part of our job is to like help people. I think it just naturally gives us so much more fulfillment and happiness in life. Like even yes. if I have a bad day or e- no matter how bad things get, I I still feel like I did something good. <laughs> and I could, I, I feel like I could die with that. Like I, I could die tomorrow yeah. and I'm, I'm fulfilled with this life. And I think that's something that more, I, I kind of wish everyone had something like that where they could see Gosh. their life from a, oh, look at the impact I made. Even if it's small, right? Even if it's in your family or church community or something um, to think of life in that way. That gives me goosebumps to hear because it's really like, that's what matters, right? Like it's that feeling of I did something with my life. Um, Like you can't find meaning or purpose for yourself. You have to do it through how you help other people. And to your point, like because of this work that we get to do, like I get to help people every day. Like what a privilege, what an honor, right? Like I'm so lucky. And I, as, as you said, I, I want everyone to feel like that way and find their own unique ways that they can help and make a difference in the, in their communities or wherever they want to serve. Yeah. I also want to discuss the point about, like, I know you focus, your happiness is defined by helping other people, but I, I I do have to say it has to be both parts, right? It has to be, you have to give to yourself and do what makes you happy. And it could be Mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't help people. Like I love reading. I love singing. Does that help people? Not necessarily, but I, it's, it, to me, I, I think you need both parts, like the, the things that bring you joy and then also helping other people. Yeah, for sure. And I would say that um, what you're doing in those moments of like reading and singing and anything else that is not necessarily about directly helping people, like those are developing who you are as a person, which then makes it possible for you to give of yourself in different ways. Like I'm sure that, you know, like I would imagine, tell me if I'm wrong, but like after you go and you sing, do you feel more like energetic and inspired? Right. And, I feel great. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. what does that do? That makes it possible for you to show up for other people as yeah. well. Right. So it's, it's that focus on like, there are things that help you to be more of yourself and feel alive and, you know, connected to the world and all of that. And that allows you to then show up in new ways. Um, and that's really important. Definitely. It's like the, the concept of self-love, like, like you have to give it to yourself before you can love others and pour into others. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's also important to call out, like you have to receive help too. Mm-hmm. Like oh, yeah. if you are giving help, you also need to be receiving help from others as well. Like you can't not participate in that. You have to, um, you have to be willing to uh, ask for help when you need it and receive it when people offer it. And that's often really tricky for people. Yeah. Cause I think that's a component that people forget is important to happiness is like the social connection. Like we're humans are meant to rely on each other, but we've been recently our society. So like individualist and we're realizing that that's not healthy. (laughs) Not really working for us. Yeah. It's not really working. So something needs to change. We, we need is. each other. Like, mm-hmm. We do need each other. We desperately need each other. And it's so interesting, right? Like in these individualistic cultures, the idea of needing someone is like the worst thing that you it's can like do. It's like a weakness, it's, right? It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so strange. But at the end of the day, like every single thing that happens in our lives is because somebody else was there for us. Like somebody, I always think I'm like, well, somebody made this computer that I'm talking to you on and other people made this technology that made this conversation possible. Like we forget, (laughs) (laughs) like we need each other so much. And I would love to see us build a world where we weren't uh, decrying people for needing stuff, but celebrating those needs and trying to fulfill them. Wouldn't that be so much better for us? Oh, definitely. Like, I just know, like, in this era, ever since the pandemic, like, loneliness is such an epidemic, right? Especially with younger generations. And then even, yeah, they might hear it's important to reach out, communicate, connect with people, but how? (laughs) I think a lot of people don't even know how. So do you have advice for our listeners on, like, how to even begin to start connecting with people more? Yeah, I think one way that can make it really simple is to maybe think about those like types of hobbies and experiences that you talked about, like reading or singing or whatever your thing is, you know, like gardening, cooking, and figure out 
where there's a community that's already devoted to that. So like, for example, if you, um, if there's a singing group or like a church group you can sing at or whatever, like find a place where people are also engaging in that activity that you are enjoying doing, and then go and take the brave step and put yourself out there, go and kind of show up. It's going to be a lot easier because you have something to talk about with them, right? Or you have an activity to do together. It makes it safer and you're not at risk of being rejected because, most people who have a hobby or a passion, they love to talk about it. They love to share it with people. I know that, you know, if, if I had like a singing group and you showed up and you wanted to join, I'd be so excited that you wanted to <laughs> participate, right? And it would be yeah. a really easy way to make friends. Um, so sometimes starting with like um, finding people who you have things in common with can be a nice way to make that a little safer to do. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay. So now I kind of want to ask you about your lifestyle, right? Like, are there any habits, routines, or things that, that you do consistently in order to maintain this life of happiness? <laughs> I really am obsessed with prioritizing my sleep. <laughs> so okay. that's a boring that's a great answer, one. But... <laughs> no, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think sleep is so important. I mean, I'm one of those people who, um, needs to get their, their hours in. I'm not good on limited sleep and stuff like that. So, um, prioritizing sleep, going to bed early, um, you know, taking time to unwind in the evening. That's always really important for me. When I wake up in the morning, I usually try and set an intention or just kind of breathe for a few minutes and kind of pause, do some sort of light meditation. And I, I honestly, like I use two intentions most of the time. The first is, um, like, can, may I use this day to be myself and give up myself? So like kind of trying to affirm that idea of happiness or today I will do my best to love myself and love others, which is sort of another way of saying the same thing. Um, so I, I try and use that to remind me of what matters most. And then I have a kind of spin on gratitude, which is as I go through the day, I try and think about who who helped me, who's helping me, you know, like who showed up for me, who was there for me because yeah. we take it for granted. We like tend to miss it. And like, you know, just the little moments like, oh, my partner brought me a coffee in the morning. Like that was really nice. Or someone sent me a nice email. All of these little moments of help. It makes me feel connected to the world and like I'm not alone. And it inspires me to to give back as well. Yeah. I love that. Cause it's, I, I think what you're doing is you're just reaffirming this framework that, and this life that you want to see. Cause everyone's reality is based on how they filter it. Like the same person, mm-hmm. like let's say someone else could have just as much like support or friendliness from the people around them, but they don't, they're focused on themselves. So they don't even see it. Right. The fact yeah. that you make it a point to pay attention to all the ways people are helping you in your life. It just, makes you feel more connected. Exactly. It's so, um, it's so comforting because I, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I felt really lonely and really alone. Like I was by myself and kind of struggling to deal with a problem. And it, it's such a horrible feeling. And a lot of those times I was actually not paying attention to the ways that people were showing up to help me. Yeah. I was ignoring it. And, Mm -hmm. um, it would have made those times a lot easier if I'd had the awareness to be like, Hey, um, people are there for you. People are helping. If you want something different, you might need to ask, you might need to be explicit about what it is that you want, but there are people around you and you're not alone. Uh, and I guess like it ultimately for me, it feels like it comes down to like so much of our unhappiness right now is about feeling alone and stuff. Like we don't have anyone to lean on or support that we need. And so however we can find a way to look at those interactions in our day and notice how we're showing up for one another. It really fills my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think it's so important. Like I hope that helps our listeners because everybody, we all are in a weave of human connection. Some of us just don't see it, (laughs) right? You only see what you want to see. And some people are just like blind to it. Yeah. But it is there if you pay attention. Like I'm such a believer of like, like your reality can change if if the way you look at it changes, right? So like true. it yeah. all is what you choose to pay attention to. Yeah, like there's this metaphor I learned at grad school that you're reminding me of, which is that your attention is like a flashlight and it's yes. this, you know, it's a narrow beam. Like you think about a flashlight, it's, it's bright, but it only illuminates this tiny little sliver of the world. And 
if your flashlight isn't shining on something, it's in the darkness. And so you miss it. You have to turn your flashlight to focus on what's what else is in the room. Yeah. And then this brings me back to the concepts of like old happy and new happy. I think people think, oh, I have to change my life to be happy. But I think what we're saying here is you don't have to change anything. You just have to change the focus of your flashlight, right? Like before you might be focused on my success and the outcome and whatever, my image, but then just change it to what, what we were talking about today. Like your, your, your gifts, your friends, your family, right? You've said it so beautifully. That's so, um, you just summed it up so perfectly. Yeah. I kind of realized that too, throughout this conversation. It's not like you don't have to change anything about your life. It's just, you just change your perspective and your focus. It's so true. And like, I remember when I was younger, I used to think, I used to have that feeling of like, oh, my life is a mess. I need to fix it. I need to fix my life. I need to change everything. Exactly. And it it was such a horrible feeling. Like my life is broken and your life is not (laughs) broken. There's some things in the background that need to be pulled to the foreground. Maybe that's sort of what you're saying, right? Yeah. It's so funny because I can relate to that too. Sometimes you just feel like everything's a mess. I just need to start over from scratch. <laughs> totally. I need to redo it's blank slate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not, it's like not everything is not wrong. It's just, you're just focusing on the wrong things. <laughs> Yeah. And everything, there's so much goodness around us, right? Like there's so much beauty in the world. There's so many wonderful people out there who are doing good things and trying to help and show up. And we pay so much attention to everything that's going wrong. Um, but there is so much goodness in you and around you. Yeah. I mean, this was another question that I was planning to ask was like, currently a lot of people are going through challenging times, whether it's in your personal life or just reading the news, seeing where the world is. It it feels so like scary, uncertain, and it, there's so much suffering. So like, how do you find happiness amidst all of these challenging times? I think that you try and help where you can. Like if you feel, I think there's this mistaken belief that people have about hope, which is that hope is something that happens to you. But in reality, what we know from research is that hope is something that you do. It's more of an action. It's something that you engage in and you experience hope when you are out there doing something to contribute. And I don't mean that you have to like go solve the problem that's on the front page of the newspaper, right? Like that's not, Mm. unless, unless you're listening and that is part of your job and you work (laughs) at, you know, (laughs) the UN or the government, that's great. But for most of us, that's not the case. I mean, Figure out what one small thing is that you can do to alleviate any sort of suffering in the world. And that suffering could be your best friend who just went through a breakup and who needs somebody there for her right now. It could be your mentee at work who is trying to figure out a hard new skill and is having a tough time and you could be there to help them. Any form of alleviation of suffering in the world contributes to a better world. So I feel the same sadness looking at the ways in which people suffer, but I don't ever feel hopeless. I feel empowered to want to do something about it and to contribute because I, I know that like I can do my little small part to make a difference. And that's what motivates me to keep going. I love that. It's so true. And another, it links back to something else we talked about in this conversation was, I think a lot of people feel like no matter what I do, it's not enough. But I think that's just like the mindset. It's like, you have to do that. Like, I'm making this small effort and I am enough. (laughs) Like this small effort is enough. And then even that can make you feel more at peace. And I think it's it's connected, right? This feeling of helplessness and hopelessness is because we feel like no matter what we do or what we say, it's not enough. But but you're, you're saying like, you can just change your mindset on that. Yeah, it's so true. And it's interesting because um, what you're describing is actually another impact of individualism because we think that in order to help the world, you have to be the hero who swoops right. in to save the day, right? But that's not how change happens. Change is a million people doing a tiny bit of good in their lives and in their communities, and then that adds up to make a better world. So you don't have to put that pressure on yourself to save yeah. the world. Um, yeah, no one person can up- all no, of this. no, you, you can't, <laughs> it's right? Like mm-hmm. it would be, you're setting yourself an impossible task. And ironically, the more pressure you put on yourself to do that, the less likely people are to actually do something at all, like any small thing. Um, so instead just be like, Hey, my job is to be there to help the people around me. And that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's enough. It's a key, key phrase. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, another question for you is how can we have greater compassion for ourselves? Because I think a lot of people do struggle with that. I have this exercise that I like to do, um, which I call loving eyes. And so if you're listening, think about somebody who is suffering. Think about that friend who's going through a breakup or think about somebody who you don't know, but who doesn't have enough money to pay their bills or is struggling with an illness. Just think about anyone in pain right now and pay attention to how that makes you feel to see them in your mind's eye. And you'll probably notice that your eyes start to soften because you're sort of filled with love. You're looking at them with love. And then I want you to turn that gaze, that loving gaze onto yourself and look at yourself in the same way and say, here is a person who is struggling and who is suffering and who is having a hard time. And just like that other person, this person, me, needs love and care and deserves support and other people to show up for them. And it's almost like a softening that you give to yourself that then allows you to say, okay, what do I need right now? You know, what is it that would help me and support me in this moment? Because in many ways, I think that the more that you ask yourself that question of what would be the most loving thing I can do for myself right now, the easier it becomes to practice treating yourself with kindness and compassion. Yeah. Key question. What is the most loving thing I can do for myself? Because so I think most of the time people are the opposite. They, they criticize themselves. Oh, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't have done this or yeah. whatever. But like seeing yourself with the eyes of love basically. Yeah. Giving that gift to yourself. Like you, you give it to others. So give it to yourself as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So Stephanie, if you were to have like a final message that you want to leave with our listeners today, what would that be? Oh, I think I would tell you that you're enough. You're loved. You have so much to share with the world and you matter. We need you. We need everything that you have to share. So please stop being cruel to yourself. Please stop beating yourself up. Please love and share yourself because that's what will change the world for the better. Beautiful. Um, and then lastly, where can we find you online for more? Probably the best place is um, my website, which is thenewhappy.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. This was a beautiful Thank conversation. You. I just feel like we're on the same wavelength. I think oh, we get each too. other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful. It was, I'm so grateful. It's a fun conversation. And it's so nice to talk to somebody who is excited about these ideas and who believes in them as well. I'm so yes. thankful. <laughs> I feel like we live different paths, but we came to the same conclusions, right? Yes. These were also the things yeah. that I learned in my journey. And then hearing you speak about it from your perspective in like your, just in your point of view, it's, it's like the same thing, but like hearing it in a new way, which is really nice. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me. And it's so special to find somebody who's like on this path. I feel so grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Everyone, oh, definitely check you. out Stephanie Harrison, The New Happy. And you have a new book coming out, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I forgot to mention, it's called The New no. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you so much for having me and for sharing. 